welcome to Duality Check, the podcast where two brothers embark on a thrilling journey through the realms of scientific inquiry, the enigmatic mysteries of the past, and the uncharted territories of spirituality. Join us as we explore the wonders of our world and beyond, all while embracing the roles of curious bystanders rather than experts. Together, we'll unravel the intricate tapestry of existence, blending the dichotomies of knowledge and wonder, get ready to question, ponder, and delve into the dualities that shape our understanding of reality on Duality Check. I'm Drew. And I'm Dean. Welcome back for episode seven. Yeah, man. This is... Woo! Woo. Man, Um, I remember when it was episode one. I know. (laughs) So far, so good. I'm enjoying myself. Um, it's been fun. Yeah. Uh, today we're going to be talking about uh, the Amazon. Yeah. And just some, uh, there's so many interesting things tied to the Amazon forest and that yeah. region of the world. So much interesting history, so much evidence of lost and advanced civilizations. Right. Um, Beyond how cool it is just being the Amazon rainforest, you know? Right, right. So we're going to go into some of that stuff today. Yeah, we Um, wanted to start today, though, do a little segment we haven't done before. Um, We've gotten a few emails mm -hmm. and some correspondence from, you know, family, friends, and just some other random people as well. We want to start off by reading and talking about. Cool. So... Let's uh, start off with an email we just got. Yeah. This person did not say we could use their name, so thank you. True. Um, they didn't say we couldn't, though. Yeah, but... <laughs> no, I know. <laughs> anyway, he says, uh, you guys should check into something called Old World Buildings. The theory is that many of the great buildings, like some state capitals and great cathedrals, were built thousands of years ago. And we're here when human when the human race settled different parts of the world. Um, my lunch break is a cool YouTube channel where I came across the subject. Mm. Just thought it was an interesting topic you guys could look into. Thanks. Right on. Yeah. Thank you, Anonymous. Thanks for the email. Um, I just uh, browsed the YouTube channel here a little bit. They got some cool titles. Um, oh, yeah. Finding Old Money. Buildings um, hold old world gold. Yeah. That's a tongue twister. Yeah. This one is a building that's apparently been closed to the public for 80 years. I like that one. Oh, wait, where'd it go? Which one? Up here? Um, oh. Yeah, yeah. 1800s, giants, orphans, and two asylums. Hmm. That's a lot of different types of things all in one thing. This is cool. I'm gonna have to watch some of these. They're like, they're like what, ten to fifteen, ten to fifteen. Yeah, they're they're relatively short. Minute videos. I did a quick sample of a couple of these and giants. It it sounds fun. It seems like just a guy sitting in his car on his lunch break, being showing some like crazy old pictures of like architecture architecture and being like, "Yo, this crap is old." Melted buildings are mountains. I'll have to check that out. <laughs> Sounds interesting. Cool. Anyway, yeah. Yeah, thanks for the email. We'll have to check that out. We'll mm-hmm. check it out. We'll look into it. Um, I've got one here. Um, mm-hmm. A message we received on Facebook. Um, basically, this person, um, they, this person did ask to remain anonymous. Um. However, they are from Canada. Not that that is any significance. Um, yeah, he wanted to share. He shared a few clips and a few articles and a person named um, Greg, Greg Vezina. Vezina. And this person apparently, Mr. Vezina said the clean ammonia made from sunlight water and air with the hydrogen cracked form it on demand yeah so this whole thing is about uh oh, clean cars yeah it's like a an engine made to run on ammonia 
Yeah, uh, the hydro fuel NH3 burning. ammonia car. It's a 1981 Chevy Impala that was retrofitted to work on ammonia. Yeah. And then... Uh, Yeah, apparently the Canadian Prime Minister met with this Vizina person and they never talked about the ammonia car. Hmm. Yeah, he sent us some newspaper articles and stuff. So uh, that'll be a fun one to dig into. I actually... We we talked about that before. Do we have that written down on our show notes? I'm sure not. But like alternative energy devices? Yeah. I'm, I know we've talked about it. So. Yeah, there's like a whole world we can go into with like absolutely different like clean energy devices. Uh, that's definitely going to be a show in the future. Absolutely, we'll definitely include some of this stuff too. Yeah, thanks for the message. And then we got a third one from our older sister. Oh yeah, you got it up. Yeah, I got it. Um. This is in reference to the last episode um, that you guys heard anyway when we're recording this one. Yeah, the secret history of the world part one. Mm -hmm. And yeah, she says, love the latest episode. I'm all about the lion. Had my own little Leo. Our nephew. Our nephew. She's like, love the artwork you picked. The lion symbol special to me. Why my sweet son brought me this, bought me this necklace, and I wear it always. It's a little, little photo of a little, uh, little lion, lion necklace that she wears, which is cool. She says, "I I feel a strong connection to the sun. Totally a sun worshiper, and I need it. Winter months are really hard for me. I get outside every day, though. I know the sun is hidden behind those clouds, still there for me. You mentioned the Vedas, maybe an episode on that. I resonate so much with Vedic knowledge." I've been studying it for years and practice the diet as best I can for my dosa. I don't know what that means. Oh, I'm sure it means something. She'll tell us. I am a pita all the way, baby. <laughs> I don't know what that means either. <laughs> or what she means by that. I know what a pita is. Right. <laughs> <laughs> she, uh, yeah, what, she, what does she mean by that? Uh, she says, uh, you also ask for people to share uh, experience with the flow state. She says, mm-hmm. she's been in that state many times. It feels like time doesn't seem to exist. You encounter no pushback. Whatever you're doing or experiencing is effortless and easy and feels like a quote unquote flow state. You're at ease, happy, not a worry in the world. People are drawn to you. From my experiences, those things that evoke the flow state do change over time. Take, for example, my crystal jewelry business. When I first discovered them, I was researching and creating um, and running a business with them. It all worked out. It was easy. I was happy. I made money, connections. I knew it was meant to be at the time. I never lost interest in it, but I paid attention to how it became less and less part of my flow. And there was less and less connections being made or good feelings being had. The money was there, but it wasn't why I was doing it. I always trust my flow, and it has guided me always in the right direction. I've suddenly, or I've successfully ran two businesses now, letting the flow state guide me. I feel it now with my current clients, which I easily have found new clients and families to help on my own without working for a company because I believe I'm doing what I'm supposed to and in my flow. Yeah. She says, Drew, I feel it when I'm with your boys. I could spend hours with them and it's like a blink of the eye and it's over. They bring such joy and love and that flow state I'm trying to describe to you. I know you've both experienced that. You're welcome for the long rant. Love you both so much. Keep up the good work. <laughs> yeah, no, I know I know exactly what she's talking about when she's the way she's describing that. Yeah. Yeah. And then she suggests some show topic ideas, uh synchronicities archetypes and personalities that would be fun i've done some looking Mm. into that at least in one system um numerology i would be Mm. very interested in looking at that astrology she says she wants to learn vedic astrology Mm. astrology i've gotten a lot bigger interest in since i've been like following well numerology and astrology i've gotten bigger interest in since following randall carlson yeah you were doing the sacred geometry class yeah i did his sacred geometry intro course 
But I also bought some of the recommended reading he suggested, but I haven't read them yet, so I would like to probably do an episode. It's suggested. On that. Yeah. Not required. <laughs> uh she talks about maybe during the cleanse I'm about to start, talk about diet and cleansing. Yeah, I'm planning on doing a uh uh a keto and probably um intersperse that with like some three fasting, day fasting yeah, and stuff. And my, maybe yeah. experiment with even longer if I feel that it works for me. But uh yeah, we I'd be down to do a show on that once uh Yeah, especially while you're in the middle of it, you know, mm-hmm. like while you're feeling the feelings and doing the things and like explaining yeah. what you're feeling and Talk all that. Talk about all the stuff that like led me to the decision. Sure. And then uh, you know, in future episodes I can like report on my progress or whatever. Absolutely. Uh she wants she asked for mushroom, C B D, psychedelics. That oh, would yeah. be Where are totally you? We're on top of that. Totally. Uh afterlife, spirits, ghosts. Uh, I don't know if we have like a ghost episode planned. I haven't personally looked into ghosts or like poltergeist activity much. I've always like taken it with a grain of salt, but I'm, I would be interested in looking into it more because I am actually open to it. The yeah, closest not, thing that we have planned on this one is uh, a reincarnation episode. Right, yeah. Yeah, I'm not like super into go- I like I like a good ghost story video like if it's really well you know told like a Mm -hmm. good story but i'm not like a i'm not like a disbeliever either it's just i'm not it doesn't like something that's like resonates with me like when i'm looking through and like reading stuff like Mm -hmm. if i come across something like that i'm just yeah but i am down to to look into it a little bit more she said meditation crystals manifesting um Meditation for sure. Well, we kind of covered a little bit of that with the consciousness, with the uh, the consciousness episode, and yeah. talking about the shamanism. But uh, it would be personally, I haven't done a lot of research into different meditation practices. I'd be interested. I might need someone. Maybe we could bring Amy. I think on we bring to talk Amy, about crystals. I think we bring Amy. On I don't know anything about that. I think that whole suggestion there is her trying to say she wants on the show. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Amy, you All got right, us. You're in. Um, she suggests one on protecting our earth, being eco-friendly and mindful of our planet's health and well-being. I think that's actually a really good idea because I find that super valuable and important, but not in the way it's sold to us by the mainstream these days. No, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. Talking about it from a more realistic point of view. Yeah. And not focusing around carbon dioxide, which is plant plant food. (laughs) <laughs> right. Right. Uh, yeah, and just yeah, like the bullet definitely. points that are spewed out, man. There's a lot of really important ways that people could be involved in. Thanks, Amy. Yeah. We appreciate all the feedback. Heck yeah. You're definitely our number one fan so far. Totally. Yeah, we get the most feedback from her, and yeah. I love it. And don't stop. No, please don't. Yeah, we need to start sending you early access so you can give us... Give us some uh, some feedback even yeah. before we post a, an episode. And anyone else listening, uh, send us a message. Mm-hmm. If you have show ideas. Yeah, we want to keep doing this kind of stuff where we do segments on yeah. you know, people interacting with us. And- We're very much interested in, you know, because there's, you guys obviously probably have a feel so far for the types of stuff we're into. And if you think there's something that might be up our alley, like, just because we're into this weird stuff doesn't mean all the weird stuff is on our radar. So exactly, yeah. Like we are so open to a lot of this weird stuff, but doesn't mean that's the stuff that we're naturally consuming or like looking into on a day to day basis. So we'd love to hear from you, stories, you know, suggestions. If you're an expert in one of these like types of fields, mm-hmm. we'd love to talk to you. Yeah, that absolutely. Would be fun. Yeah. Um, yeah, we, we we do plan to get some guests on the show at some point. Mm-hmm. Um. And talk about this stuff like Amy will probably be our first one. She might, yeah, she might be. <laughs> she might be. We also have a like a. I got a close friend of mine whose mom has been part of uh, MUFON for a long time. That's right. You're telling me that it would be cool to get her on. It's I need funny to and, just buy her dinner and like take yeah, her out and yeah. pick her brain one night just to like get a feel for all the stuff she knows. Definitely. But, yeah, you should probably tell tell him before just so it's not weird that you're taking his mom out on a date. Uh, yeah, I don't care. 
<laughs> just kidding. <laughs> I think it's it'd funny be more funny if he thinks I'm moving in on his mom. Yeah, that's true. That's just funny. <laughs> I'll uh, I'll message him and be like, hey, did you know Dean's taking your mom out tonight? <laughs> now that would be fun. So yeah, thanks for all the feedback, people. Uh, keep it coming. Um, yeah, we look forward also, to more. Also, if you're interested in getting involved in the show, we could use some people to uh, um, send us a message letting us know like, hey, this little moment here from you know I one hour to an yeah. hour and 10 minutes I think is like really great. You guys should consider sharing that as a little clip. We're looking for like little five, 10 minute clips, little yep. 30 second clips to share yep. on like TikTok and YouTube shorts and yeah. stuff like that. And actually on, I believe on YouTube specifically too, you can actually clip it yourself and send it to us. Mm. So you yeah. can actually create your own clip of a time segment and then, you know, write a yeah. message to us, send it to us and be like, you can hey, also I really do like that. this. Um, I don't know. Anyone who uses or I hate iPhone, it either way. Uh, I don't know if you're the overcast podcast app is really great. Mm. Um, it also has the ability to like, when you share, hit the share button, you can actually like clip out a section and share like a little snippet from the audio podcast player, oh, which cool. is really cool. Um, oh yeah. Yeah. We would love if anybody or everybody <laughs> would do that. Totally. It helps us out. You know, we're doing all of the recording, editing, all that stuff ourselves. So anything to get any, people involved. Any help is helpful. Any help is helpful. And getting people involved and, and, uh, on board and, you know, that's what we're looking for. Create a little community around this stuff. Totally. Uh, yeah. Anything else? Do we have any other messages? I think that's all for that's the messages for now. for now. Um, keep them coming. Keep them coming. Let's, uh, get into the topic for today, which is the Amazon. Dun, dun, dun. I don't know why we did that. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So, to my notes here. Do you want to start out, or do you want me to start out? I want. I'm interested to to hear a little bit about the book you read. Okay. So I'm gonna be reporting on a couple of books here tonight. Um, the first one is called River of Darkness. Um, Francisco de Oriana and the Deadly First Voyage Through the Amazon. So it basically covers this. Uh, the first complete trek across the Amazon River by Europeans. Yeah. Um, so it was done by the Spanish conquistadors in the 1500s and the 1530s. Right. Um, so they started out in Peru in um, Quito and went over the Andes Mountains. They walked over the Andes Mountains. They marched over the Andes Mountains. <laughs> Uh, because they had been hearing rumors of El Dorado, of all these oh, that's wealthy what they were looking for. civilizations inside the Amazon. They had heard they were up at the headwaters, and so they thought if they go over the Andes, that's a better route than coming in from the west where people had tried, or from the east where people had tried before and going up the Amazon. I see. So they thought if we start in Peru, we go over the Andes, Maybe we can find the headwaters there and find um, El Dorado that way. Um, it's Yeah, so I got a bunch of – I'll read some different snippets here. Um, so this was uh, Francisco de Oriana. He was second in command. The first in command was a guy named uh, Gonzalo Pizarro. Oh, yeah. Um, his older brother, Francisco – Pizarro was the one who like conquered p the Peru area. He was like the Cortez of like the Peru area. Where did they, how did, I mean, how did they get to that side of the, did they go through the country, like through the continent? I don't know the answer to that. I haven't studied that part of or, the history. Yeah, I'm curious. Or, or did they, they sail they all the way around sail? South America? Yeah, curious. Anyway, I don't know in those early years if they necessarily had the technology to sell all the around, but by that point, Cortez had already conquered Mexico. Mm. So it's conceivable that they could have like Just built ships going. on the West Coast oh, okay. and then sailed down the West Coast from there. Oh, uh, okay. That's, so I don't know. That's possible, yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Um, so. This is, uh, it was, uh, Gonzalo Pizarro was the one 
um, who was in command. Uh, Francisco de Oriana had already wanted to do the same thing, and he had heard that Gonzalo was doing a uh, expedition basically the same as he had planned. And so, uh, so he hopped like, on board. He hopped on board um, and was told by literally. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, they walked over the Andes. They had to get so down to Peru, though. He was told by Gonzalo to, uh, he had to go like tend to some stuff. And then he said that I, I'll go tend to this stuff. I'll gather whatever men and resources I can, and then I'll meet you. So the plan was to go over the Andes and meet at a camp, basically. And so Gonzalo took an army of 220 soldiers. Including harquebusiers, crossbowmen, and infantry. Harquebusier is like the Spanish is like a Spanish early Cross, Spanish crossbow. rifle. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Firearm. Okay. Uh, so nearly two hundred horses, armored and fitted for battle. Great stores of ammunition and powder. A herd of some two thousand to three thousand stinking, snorting swine for consumption. Highland llamas as pack animals, snarling horde of nearly 2,000 war hounds, trained Jeez. not only for battle and intimidation of hostile Indians, but also to herd the swine, and about 4,000 Indian porters chained and shackled until the moment of departure to preclude escape. These unfortunates would bear the brunt of the expedition's enormous loads, including tons of material for building bridges or vessels, while the Spaniards carried nothing but a sword and a shield and a small sack of food beneath it. Among the 4,000 porters were a good many native women brought to cook tortillas for the Spaniards and to serve as sex slaves. Jeez. So we're not, we're talking about 220 soldiers that bring thousands of, thou like, thousands of animals thousands of dogs th thousands of slaves mm -hmm. and a bunch of materials that the, all of those you know aforementioned you know animals and people are going to carry for them yeah jeez so it's not just a, a 220 small 220 group of people looking to explore no they're looking to conquer and the slaves they didn't give them any sort of like uh uh, material preparation or gear. Right, so they're just barefoot probably. and Barefoot hiking over the Andes, which are some of the tallest mountains in the world. These high passes with like snow peaks and glaciers. Oh gosh. And actually by the time they get to the other side of the Andes, um, which um, basically like most of their slaves are dead. Of course. and Because they're just from the elements. Mm hmm Just from the elements. And then uh, Francisco de Oriana finally meets up with them there, and they're, like, tending to – trying to, like, figure out, like, what yeah, to do to next. Yeah. They've burned through a giant chunk of their food stores already. Mm. Um, and then from there, they they move on, and it's, like, not long until they run out of food. Wow. And all their slaves are dead, and they've got, like, a handful of, like, of the pigs and dogs and horses left. Wow. And then they start freaking out and trying to figure out what they should do next. And they consider going back, but the, the route back is what put them in that condition. Right, I was going to say, they lost that much just doing that. I mean, they're all dead if they go back. Yeah, yeah. And so they come up on the idea of uh, building a boat instead. And so they find the first like rivers mm. on the other side and they construct a ship. Because uh, these rivers are pretty pretty wide, yeah? Mm-hmm. I know I had watched a few videos and read a few articles that talked about like it being like a three-quarters of a mile wide. That's at like some, some of the biggest places but yeah. we're talking about like, like the, the headwaters Amazon itself, where some of the tributaries are forming and stuff yeah. so not quite as big at the start mm -hmm. um but still big and it's dense jungle and they can't find any people they can't find they get attacked they do get attacked at some point and then later on they can't find people they can't find resources they're scattered and they had broken. taken um 
for some of the people they did find and attacked, they kept a bunch of – they would kept capturing these chiefs of whatever tribe they would come across as slaves. And they would use those people's knowledge to like navigate. Oh, and those see. people would be telling them about, you know, up ahead, you'll find this and that. Um, until those people escaped, those they like found a moment and they were able to escape. And yeah, they know the terrain better. Mm -hmm. And so they lost all their local guides. And while, oh, so Francisco de Ariana, he actually um, studies languages. And so during the time while they do have those guides, he figures out how to communicate with He's them. He's the translator. He actually figures out all the local languages there um. and translates. Um, but he doesn't have the forethought to like discuss like survival and like survival tactics. Cause he's just trying to like figure out where the hell to go. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, while he could have been spending all that time before they ran away, like figuring out like what, what tree, do you what's, eat? what's what do you, edible, yeah, how yeah, to yeah. process things, like where how to, to find hunt. certain animals. Yeah, right. exactly. So they don't have any of that information. They're almost out of food. And then they run out of food. Time's ticking. Yeah. Clock's ticking. And so they don't want to like slaughter all their horses yet because they think they'll need them. Um, so at some point, like they they get to such a sorry sorry state that they're like they're like making gruel out of like shoe leather and oh. like any herbs they can find, and people are getting sick and. <clears throat> And like lo losing their mind a little bit from like eating plants they don't know about. And right. Yeah. So it gets really bad. And so Oriana proposes to Pizarro that he take a detachment of people and go down the river because the boat they build isn't big enough for the whole, the whole expedition. Crew. Yeah. So he takes about 50 people. And a bunch of the resources, the weapons, the ammunition and gunpowder and all that. Mm. And they take off. The deal is that he's supposed to come back in like 12 days. He's supposed to go down, find whatever he can, and then come back. Because before the, uh, the, na the navigators, the chiefs, um, right. had escaped, their next destination, they were told that, to, that they were basically a few days away from a big tributary coming in and joining the river. And that if they go up that, they can find like a, Something, a bunch of food. Civilization or food right. or whatever. And so they were, their plan was to go ahead because when they had built the ship, they would use the ship because most of their slaves had died to carry a bunch of the heavy stuff right. while they would try and like walk along, walk it, along it beside. Yeah. But the, that was... I mean, you got like creeks coming in all the time. They're having to build bridges. They're having to swim their horses. Like, it's like treacherous terrain. Sounds like De. What's his name? De Oriana. De Oriana. De Oriana. It sounds like he knew the only way to survive was to get away from the mass group <laughs> and to take a few people down and go and find some resources on his own. Well, that's not like. who he claims, and he, like, very officially claims not well, to. Well, of course, because that's treason. Yeah, so they, they he's got they a, uh, a friar with him and his crew as well who takes, like, meticulous notes. He's the one that recorded all this. Yeah. Um, history, is, history is written by the victors, though. Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, they survived. But so, did all of them survive? Because I don't... I, I bet... Uh, actually, going, Pizarro's yeah. crew did survive oh, okay, as well. Okay, they did. Okay, but, okay. So they go forward, and he thinks they missed whatever tri tributary that they were supposed to find. And then the river just gets bigger and bigger and faster and faster. And they realize that there's no way they'll be able to paddle back up a river and they hit the point of and no return. Keep their deal of the twelve days, and. So they just kind of keep going for a little while. Hmm. And then they come across um, a civilization. Um, they come across some um, natives there who are able to be spoken to by Oriana. Where he figures out how to communicate with them and they get a bunch of food. And just really? in the nick of time, they were like starving themselves. Dead. They're yeah. basically about to be, be gone. 
So uh, they rest there for a while, and um, these people were nice, huh? They let them, they mm-hmm, let them live, mm-hmm. huh? And then uh, after the twelve days that came and went, and then a little beyond that, then uh, Pizarro uh, sends some people to try and find them or any sign of them. And uh, those people don't find them. They find a little bit of signs that they were moving forward because they would pull off to the side of the river and camp at night. Um, so they yeah, find a little right. bit of evidence of that. But then they find what they think was that tributary, and they go up river and they find this big plant plantation. Mm. Um. So that's the next uh, okay. section I want to read from because it's pretty interesting. Let's hear it. So, uh, yeah. On the 10th day, they arrived at the abandoned plantations, famished beyond reason once again. They staggered through the fields of umbrella-shaped plant leaves as all came, as all came in an exhausted state, reported one chronicler. Not having eaten anything for so many days, they did nothing but pull up yuccas with the earth still sticking to it, the roots, and began to eat them at once. One Spaniard, a man named Villarejo, sat chewing on a root of white color and rather thick. According to his comrades, he had hard, hardly even tasted it when he stood and became delirious and unintelligible, then lost his reason and became mad. Not long after, other compatriots, including some of Pineda's men, started falling sick. Their bellies distended grotesquely, Whoa. some flopping about on the ground and moaning in agony. Nevertheless, Pizarro ordered camp made. They would stay for a time where there was guaranteed food source. Um, I'm not going to read the rest of that, but essentially they find mm. this yucca farm. And yucca is, uh, there was another term for it, manioc. Manioc. So this is a, a staple um, resource that is very popular in the Amazon tribes. It's a root vegetable, kind of like potatoes. Right. But it contains a substance. Um, there we go. So, oh yeah, I'll read this part. Certainly throughout their stay in El Barco, the Spaniards had seen the villagers coming from manioc fields burdened by large carrying baskets strapped to their backs, the baskets brimming over with tubers. Once the manioc was harvested and collected and brought back to the village, the women loaded baskets full of the tubers, took them to the river, submerged them, shaking them vigorously to clean the manioc tubers of dirt before peeling them of their outer skins, cutting the sweet manioc into chunks or slicing them, um, and leaving the poisonous manioc whole. Then began the essential, never, essentially never-ending process of grading uh, using ingenious hardwood boards studded uh, with either stone or hardwood or animal-based teeth, palmwood thorns or flecks of hardwood or fish bones or bone splinters. The women bend over these graters or sit on the ground with the grater between their knees and then holding a tuber in each hand, grate viciously back and forth until the tuber is mashed into a pulp. Then they take the pulp or mash. It's transferred to a thing called a tapiti, a long tubular woven basket that closes at one end about six or seven feet long. The, t- the tapitis hold the watery manioc mash with stone or heavy log tied to one end. They compress it to mm. leach out all the poisonous prusik acid making the manioc safe for consumption. And then they also roast it. So there's this whole process you have to go through with with the manioc in order to make it safe to eat. Mm. And it's consumption and use and domestication goes back thousands of years. But the Spaniards didn't know the process. So Pizarro's crew, they end up at this manioc plantation and they just start eating they and just, they get whatever. super sick. Because they see a plantation, they assume everything's edible. Right. They just start eating and they're so hungry. Right. So some of them just ate it raw. Some of them had the sense to like cook it, but some of them were impatient. And so uh, I think they did lose a couple people due to this. Um, even if you just cook it, it sounds like there's a whole process you got to do. Right. Not just even just cooking it. So Pizarro's people <laughs> end up uh, hiking back over the Andes. They After go, this? Yeah, they go back and they actually they make, make it, it. But they lose a lot of people, but Damn. they did make it. It must be just Pizarro and one other person he's eating or something. Cannibalism. 
yeah, so then uh, Oriana had just he just starts the process of heading down the Amazon. It's it's real quick. I want to mm. say I looked it up and it says um, the derivative of the of that is cassava, 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 mm. and it is if it is prepared prepared improperly can contain chemicals that are converted to cyanide in the body. Yeah. So they were getting cyanide poisoning and led and led to certain like paralysis. Yeah. Okay. This is modern science saying this. So, yeah. So Oriana and his crew, they, they, uh, hang with this, uh, these friendly Indians. Um, I'm only using, I don't like the term Indian. I'm using it cause that's what they use in the book. That's how they describe them. Yeah. Um, Anyway, they're hanging out with them, and then uh, they kind of get the lay of the land for the next bit of the river, and they're warned that after about a couple hundred miles of this kingdom that is friendly to them, then the next kingdom down is not friendly, and they mm. will be attacked. And so they get to that area, and sure enough, they're attacked. And so starts this process of them essentially going down the river and then when they run out of food they have to like pick a place to with civilization where it's not too much of people attacking them where they can like crash their boat aboard or on the shore yeah and invade the village steal a bunch of food and then hopefully and get out of there. Take life. back off. And so they do this over and over and over again. Mm. Um, but any, anywhere where possible, he does try to like reason with people. So Oriana is not like Pizarro. He's a little less warlike. He prefers to talk and to be friendly before sure. uh, using violence, but he seems does like, resort to violence. Seems like that's why he was able to make friends with this first village. Probably. Yeah. I mean, if he wasn't that way, they probably wouldn't have made it. Yeah, because no, they if wouldn't they wouldn't, have, yeah. They, if they had to fight literally the entire way, they would have probably died a riddle. Well, they wouldn't have made it past that first village yeah. if they were immediately trying to attack the people they saw. Yeah, yeah. so they, they stayed so there hungry. for like a month, though, in that first village. Oh, wow. And they actually make another boat. Oh, wow. Yeah, or at least they, it talks about them like, because they actually don't have, with the own, like 50 people or so they have, they don't have like the, all the specialties needed. Uh, they call it a brigantine. I don't know the difference, but yeah, the brig- yeah, he, they're the person, the boatmaster kind of person. Yeah. So they said the hardest thing for them to figure out was how to make nails. Mm. But uh, the uh, the villagers actually would like assist them in gathering resources and would keep them fed. Wow. Oh. Um, until he started getting the vibe that they were outstaying their welcome. And so they took all the materials and all the nails they made and they kept they sailing now. Started moving on. Uh, until they found a place to stop and like finish a second boat. Um, anyway, so this next part I want to read is from uh, one of their raids. Okay. So they go on, they land and they crash and they go on one of these raids. All right. Uh, what I found interesting about this is, or I'll point it out afterwards, but um, so they had just done battle. And they're retreating back to the brigantines. Okay. So this intense battle over, at least for the moment, Oriana led the fittest of his men to find Maldano if they could. By good fortune, they met on the same path. Maldano had been returning with his beleaguered men, and Oriana could see that Maldano himself and all the rest were bludgeoned and bleeding. One of these men was so badly injured that he died of his wounds eight days later. Remarkably, Maldano had managed to get away with many turtles. That Maldonado. was one of the food. Maldonado. Oh, I was saying it wrong. <laughs> it's all good. Uh, looking over his troops and assessing the situation, Oriana ordered that 18 injured men receive immediate medical treatment back at the huts before they got to the brigantines. The number of wounded was devastating, uh, constituting a full third of his force. The two priests were charged with their care, though they could offer little in the way of medicine having along with them no other remedy but a quote-unquote certain charm mm. friar caravajal doing magic and was who helped attend the wounded does not specify 
what this certain term was exactly, but it's possible that the men had learned something of Amazonian medicine having to do with the plants and herbs or even connected to sorcery and shamanism during their long months in Aparia. That's what it sounds like to me, magic. It's conceivable that they had learned and acquired some of the botanical or spiritual treatments for injuries while there. Caravajal would have been well aware that the Holy Inquisition in Lima, Mexico City, and Cartagena established okay. charges against acts of superstition and charms. But under the circumstances, this far removed from civilization without any of their own medicines, the rules and writs could respectfully and of necessity be ignored. Yeah. Whatever charm Carvajal employed, he believed it had positive results for within two weeks, all were cured except for the one who died. Well, wow. Which is pretty interesting. Yeah. Um, so, that is pretty interesting. Yeah, that kind of ties back to like our talk about shamanism. Yeah. And uh, they have a elevated. It's magic. I mean, yeah. I mean, for all intents and purposes, it's magic. Yeah. Whatever, the, whatever was going on in these days. Yeah. Not everything, but you know, the shamans knew. Um, That's interesting. Then this is a little, little bit later on. They're still kind of fighting through this hostile territory. Okay. Um, these people called the Amagua. Amagua. Um, they were hardly underway, having traveled only five miles or so when they reached an impressive, powerful river pouring into the Maranon from the south bank. The size of the new river appeared remarkable, even wider or so it seemed than the Maranon itself. So wide was it, Oriana's priest remarked that at one place where it emptied in, it formed three islands in view of which we gave it the name Trinity River. They had reached the confluence of the Jarura River, which hmm. appeared to flow through an abundant and prosperous land with numerous houses and buildings dotting a swath of green shoreline. Oriana ordered the men to remain on higher alert, but not to provoke any of the local population. He, avoided, he hoped to avoid any fresh confrontations. So... They're wow. like, it's crazy because, all right, so. So they're seeing civilization, 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 civilization. Yeah. Like, and, really, like, as they And I want to step back rivers. and, like, explain if you are unaware why this is, like, so important. So for most of history, so what happened is, like, after the this specific account of this expedition, this account got lost for hundreds of years. Right. And it wasn't discovered until the late 1800s. Mm. At which point, the general view was that there was no civilization was nothing, in the yeah. Amazon. Other than, other than, the than a few like scattered tribes here and there right. of hunter-gatherers. And um, usually they were on the edges of the specifically believed that there was no civilization. Right. And so yeah. these people keep coming across huge civilizations of people with farms and like amazing like building abilities and like a wealth of knowledge and like military tactics and yeah there was a description that I that I heard when I was watching a YouTube video um, on this topic um, where they describe like where Orleana or or Oriana mm -hmm. um, described as he, they went along this river they were seeing like the buildings along the river were so tightly, there was no space in between these buildings and they could see if they were going for miles mm -hmm. for miles on end. They were seeing these buildings that were so tightly packed together that there was no space in between them. And like, just what that indicates, right? Yeah. The amount of people, the amount of resources that, that this area supported. It's yeah. fascinating. And Orleana, um, he ended up eventually wanting to come back, right? We might get to that part eventually, but isn't yeah, he, that he he eventually went back to Spain. Well, after he sees all this, yeah, that that's definitely towards the end. But like, mm -hmm. um, after he like the process of him seeing all this along the Amazon and all of these Sparked people all this and intrigue. all of this wealth, yeah. and he does actually see a lot of gold and a lot I of bet. like yeah. 
Um, he's convinced, and like this he, is what he was looking. He for. wants they were to looking be a for. Cor- conquistador, like yeah, like Cortez. Like Pizarro. He wants to be able to <laughs> like have a whole domain assigned to him from the crown. Right. And so he finds this place, and he sees all these resources. And his intent after he discovers all this is to go back to Spain and get get that appointment. Another expedition funded to go and conquer these lands, which fails for him. But of course. No, he gets the funding, but no, there's yeah. a bunch of weird it's political stuff, and he doesn't failed. get as much funding as he needs to. And then by the time he gets out there, they have such like it's losses on uh, by sea on their way back west um, that they just don't have the strength or the power once they arrive to be able to do anything. They're not going to conquer anything, but they, yeah, yeah. So anyway, um, right there, in, yeah. This chapter, encountering the Amazons, chapter yes. fourteen. So this is the other reason why I find this book so fascinating. So um, the Amazons. Oh yeah, you were yeah you were telling me about that. Which yeah, is yeah. interesting, and this is I think where the Amazon jungle got its name from is because of these women that were encountered. Um, That's right. That were like gigantic, and yeah. I'll, I'll find the thing, but um, me. What's the name of this book, by the way? This is called River of Darkness. Francisco Orellana's and the Deadly First Voyage Through the Amazon. So this uh, this section here is chronicling. This is much later down the river. Um, but it's after all the initial stuff that we had already covered. Yeah. I mean, the river's huge. This whole mm-hmm. thing took them 18 months. Well, they're crossing the entire continent, right? Mm-hmm. So they get into this battle... Because they're once again out of food, and so they're going to do another one of their raids. Um, so the landing is more difficult than Oriana anticipates. As he approached, he saw numerous well-organized fighting squadrons of Indians. Knots of men formed up around the houses and buildings and the village center, teeming with warriors too numerous to count. All animated and well-armed. The spectacle was daunting. At the same moment, there came out many armed with bows and arrows from among the trees. Along the shore of the river, take, talking very loud and as if vexed, going through all sorts of contortions with their bodies, indicating thereby that they looked upon the Spaniards with scorn. Nevertheless, the brigs closed in, rowing at breakneck speed, but as the Spaniards came within range, the Indians at intervals fired well-aimed and well-timed volleys of arrows into the sky the darts whistling through the thick tropical air like the wing beats of scarlet macaws. Oriana and his men were in their armor and still suffering in their metal breastplates. Others had adopted the thickly padded cotton variety of Spanish of Spaniards under Cortez had leaned about from the Az- that they had learned that Cortez had learned about from the Aztecs. Given the accuracy of the native bowmen, they would need all the protection they had. The arrows fell from the sky, driving deluge, skewering about the Spaniards. So anyway, so then he counters with his own gunfire, and then they land on shore. Um, Probably right there. Yeah, so they get... they. Land on shore, they ram into the beach, they jump off the wo- and into the water to get on shore, and they start fighting their way on shore. Um, but the warriors kept swarming in from all sides. Far more than an hour, the Spaniards waged close and hazardous hand-to-hand battle, but no matter how many Indians they slew, more came to replace them. These, ur- these urging their fellows with on with rekindled energies... Um, According to Friar Caravajal, who watched the gruesome battle with an arrow sticking from his side, these Indians had more than just their homes to defend. They were fighting as subjects and allies of the Amazons. For what Caravajal and the others witnessed next was mystifying. Amid the throng of warriors, there appeared 10 or 12 extremely tall women warriors with pale white skin and long hair twisted into braids and wound about their heads. They are very robust, reported Oriana's priest and go about naked but with their privy parts covered, with their bows and arrows in their hands, doing as much fighting as ten Indian men. And indeed, 
There was one who shot an arrow a span deep into one of the brigantines. And others less deep that our brigantines look like porcupines. Damn. You know Um, what that makes me think of? Is um, the idea that Vikings had settled and had come to the Americas before the Europeans did. Mm Mm-hmm. Like it, it, it almost seems like a like a like a group of Viking women had gone through and just terrorized and like took yeah. took it for their own basically. There's a couple spots earlier in the book that I couldn't like bookmark properly because I was listening on audio, um, where they like describe the the legend because they had heard the legends of the Amazons before they got to this point and actually witnessed them themselves. Oh, okay, and essentially they got the legend that like. There's like a whole kingdom in the Amazon that was their territory and that they had an island that they lived on and that they would allow men to come in to breed with basically and then they would only keep the 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 women the girl children yeah um, and then once the man had bred they would kick him out wow um, and that they ruled this whole area yeah. And, and that like they, were they were saying they were gigantic, subjects of them. Large women. Wow. Um, and according to, yeah, by this account, like shooting arrows that like penetrate like deep into their ship compared to all the other arrows, like doing the fighting of 10 men, like. Damn. But they did end up killing a handful of them. Oh, so really? They weren't invincible. Right, and it wasn't the only time they encountered him either. They did encounter him earlier on as well. Or later on. Mm. And it goes on here, right? There was uh, the there's another I section I want to talk about. Yeah, that goes on like with the battle, but the details of that aren't as... I think we're ready for a break, though. I think we're way over. We're way over. We're almost ready for two breaks here. <laughs> <laughs> So let me find a little bit of the next section. We'll take a quick break and uh, we can move on from there. So yeah, Amazon rainforest and the Amazons themselves. You know, like where the Amazons come from? Like that they come from like Greek mythology. Yeah. So yeah, I think that's where like the whole name of the place comes from. It's from that legend of finding them there. Curious to see what they, to know what they called them, like what they called themselves. Yeah, I know. I'm so I would love to hear that. curious about like all of it. Man, we'll talk about it too because we've got some other stuff to come up. But yeah. yeah. Thanks for listening. We'll be right back. Adios. back from the break we did and we started recording i think we we're maybe 20 30 minutes in and yeah, then we least. just had a hard crash our computer crashed 
So, uh, I need to so figure out what the heck's going on with that. But for the meantime, we're going to give it another shot and hopefully it won't crash again on us this time. Yeah. So episode seven. I may have had too many things two. open. <laughs> episode 7.2. Yeah. Um, anyway. We'll keep going here and we'll, we'll, we'll so go over the stuff that we had already talked about, but yeah, you know, just sound a be aware. Weird or less enthusiastic about going over this stuff again. Just be aware. Because this is our second time doing it. <laughs> yeah. All right, so you had f- pulled up. Yeah, so uh, the, we were finishing of off the, the last about. bit of River of Darkness that I wanted yeah. to cover. Um, and the last bit that I wanted to cover was this, like, incredibly, like, ad- the most advanced, one of the most advanced areas that they had landed on in yeah. the travel. Um, so... At sunset, they arrived at a small and intriguing series of well-kept buildings set very high and exposed on a bank. And although the place was inhabited, its diminutive size and apparently limited popula- population convinced Oriana that he should try and land and investigate. As he drew near, Oriana could see that it was very orderly and well-maintained, so pristine that he suspected it might be a pleasure palace or a place of recreation or leisure for the local overlord. Enticing him yet further, the few natives... Or enticing him yet further, he was interested in the pleasure palace. <laughs> well, yeah, he caught his eye. The few natives resisted as well as they could for about an hour, but in the end, they relinquished the village and retreated into the forest. The Spaniards took control of the perimeter, tied up the boats, and went about investigating armed and ready. The bounty of food once again pleased Oriana, and he ordered much of it to be confiscated and prepared for travel. Most interesting, though, was a certain building the Spaniards described as a villa, a kind of warehouse or storehouse bursting with all manner of pottery of varying quality and sizes. Some small, but other pieces very large with a capacity of more than 25 arobas. And you had looked that up. That's about 25. 25 pounds. Uh, an aroba is about 25 pounds. So about 625 of the 25s is about 625 pounds. Yeah. So this is big barter, big pottery. Um, Oriana and his men marveled at the workmanship, running their hands over the finely made wares, which included jars, pitchers, and also um, other small pieces such as plates, bowls, candelabra of porcelain of the best that had ever been seen in the world. For that of Malaga, which is, uh, I guess in Spain, is not equal. Because this porcelain, which we found, is all glazed and embellished with the colors and so bright that they astonish. And even more than this, the drawings and paintings which they make on them are so accurately worked out that one wonders how, with only natural skill, they manufacture and decorate all these things like Roman articles. Oriana had good reason to be impressed by the excellence of pottery and the skill of the craftsmanship. The sheer volume discovered in the storage room suggested that this small village must be the center of a vast pottery manufacturing region perhaps employed for its distribution and trade up and down the river. The immensity further suggested that the region confirmed by their observations of continuous settlement along both banks supported a significant population base, uh, perhaps on the order of hundreds of thousands of people. They nicknamed this place Chinatown or Pottery Village. You like the Pottery Village one. I I like the Chinatown. You like it being called Chinatown? Well, yeah, because it's China. Oh, well, I actually didn't even think about that. (laughs) Sorry about my hiccups, people. He's got crazy hiccups. They keep coming back. Tonight has been nuts. Um, (laughs) (laughs) The first time we attempted, we came back. He had to spend a bunch of time with the boys. And then then we had to wait like another 10 minutes because he just had crazy hiccups. hiccups. And I had my my eyes closed. (laughs) Close that I was like doing some like breathing thing to like help myself, and then I, and then all of a sudden I feel a smack on the top of my head, and Dean hit me in the top of the head, and I and it helped. It made it better, and we got through that whole segment. <laughs> that didn't. I saw that coming. Yeah, dang it. I was trying to be. <sighs> I wasn't sneaky enough. Yeah. Anyway, this um, has been an episode. Yeah, this one's a 
eventful. <laughs> Man. I would have to edit out a lot of hiccups. Um, so yeah, Oriana was eager to learn even more about these people. He ordered his men to round up those few who hadn't fled. Uh, these people, through difficult and painstaking sign language, told Oriana that if he thought the pottery was notable, there was an equivalent amount of gold and silver in a village nearby in the interior. These few friendly locals even offered to take Oriana and his men there if he wished to see it. Um, yeah, that sounds like they're leading him into a tra trap. Yeah. That's what it sounds like to me. Yeah. They're like, hey, yeah, let's go over here. I got, yeah, we got gold. Come on. Come on over here, dude. Well, I I don't know that Cause, they cause necessarily the valued the gold in the same well, way maybe that not. the Spaniards did. But the thing is, they knew that the Spaniards valued it. Yeah. And they knew that they could lead them somewhere. Maybe that's what they were trying to do. But Oriana well, didn't want to go just because going inland was too dangerous because he be, wouldn't be able to skip away on the river if something went bad. Yeah. Apparently later on in the journey, and I hadn't gotten to that part in this review of it, but later on he does go inland at some point. Oh, really? Yeah. A little bit. Is it with another, um, like, uh, civilization that he finds? Uh, I, I, or is it just I, like they yeah. land somewhere and he decides to go and investigate? In going over America before, Graham talks about it, and I just hadn't found the part of the book on reviewing it this time where they do that. So I gotcha. wasn't able to find that snippet. But anyway, so, yeah, this place has, like, crazy fine pottery. Yeah, is, we we had talked about it a little bit, and it just seems like it was definitely like if it was all like confined in some kind of like warehouse or storehouse, like it definitely seems like it's some sort of <laughs> store. <laughs> it was definitely seems like it was some sort of like hub of trade, like yeah. it was their their re their resource of trade, you know? Yeah, like that that town happened to specialize in it, you know, and so for that. That whole region, that kingdom of that was section, wealthy. Like that yeah. town, their well specialty kept. was like the pottery. Right? Well, and, and that was it. Also, goes to show why they were so well kept. Why? <laughs> 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 why they were so well kept? Why they were so like like rich? It seemed to them, right? Like uh -huh. they were much more better off than all the other places. Like if they were like the hub, the hub <laughs> of 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 this like this could be their currency right in, in some sort of fashion right it could be like their you know their way of showing some sort of status and other places would would pay anything to get that sure yeah you know? i mean maybe that's why they had all this gold well maybe yeah maybe. i mean gold is just we don't know. abundant in the region and yeah that's true they could have just plated everything with gold because it looks cool. Yeah, I mean, it is pretty. And you can gild with it. That's true. All right. So uh, then I'm going to transition over to Graham's book here. So this is from America Before. Um, and if you're – I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with Graham Hancock, but if you aren't, um, definitely check him out. A good starting place would be his Netflix series. Um, what's it called? Uh, um, it was disaster. Um, no, it was ancient, ancient apocalypse. Apocalypse. That's it. Yeah. I, the only reason I know that is because I didn't like the name of it, and it was <laughs> it was too much like ancient aliens. Yeah, ancient aliens or something like that. Yeah. Which. I, I kind of like Age of Aliens. It definitely has inspired some stuff in my head. but For sure, yeah. It also goes way far out there sometimes. Well, and initially, like, the sta like, the general population, when they see Ancient Aliens, they're like, okay, dude. Yeah. My problem is the dude with the big <coughs> hair. He just looks too crazy to me. Yeah. <laughs> I agree. Uh, that's a terrible reason to not take it seriously, but... <laughs> no. Some you people, they just it. look like they're hard to take seriously. <laughs> <laughs> they don't make it easy to take them seriously. That's true. Yeah. He's not doing himself any favors. 
Uh, anyway, so Graham's specialty is like talking about like lost ancient civilizations and trying to like show different evidence for it. And uh, his first book on that topic, Fingerprints of the Gods, was kind of what got me into all this stuff. Um, but he's had tons of books on it, and he covers all this evidence from all over the world. Uh, but this book, America Before, is specifically about all the evidence in the Americas. So he's got right. a big chunk on North America, a big chunk on South America and the Amazon. And so I'm going to pull from some of the <coughs> Amazon sections. But before that, there's a section that's talking about like the DNA origins of the people of America. And yeah. so there's been the long-held theory – um, which the DNA does bear out in some um, aspects that um, we all know the story that during the Ice Age, there was a land bridge between Russia and Alaska, the uh, Bering Land Strait, and that people came across that into the Americas. The Ice, and the ice Age ended, and it was actually land. Yeah. yeah. Debatable. <laughs> well, the sea level was 400 feet lower. That's, that's where right. Came yeah, from. that's true. Uh, anyway, so people come in <laughs> through through Russia into America. Uh, and so there's genetic uh, relation to a lot of the Native Americans to like the Eastern Asians, Siberians. <laughs> Uh, the Denisovans, there's a bunch of Denisovan DNA found. Uh, well, not a bunch, but a little bit. Yeah, there's um, a good percentage. Just like ne Neanderthals, there's a certain percentage of Neanderthal DNA. In the Americans, there's a, a percentage of uh, uh, Denisovan DNA. Right. Um, but what's interesting is that the South Americans Ooh. actually show a... Uh, a percentage, right, of... Yeah, they show uh, – so some of the Amazon tribes – here, I'll read this part. Here we analyze genome-wide data to show that some Amazonian Native Americans descend partly from a Native American founding population that carried ancestry more closely related to the indigenous Australians, New Guineans, and Andaman Islanders. Than to any present day Eurasians or Native Americans. This signature is not present to the same extent or at all in present day Northern and Central Americans or in a 12,600 year old Clovis associated genome, suggesting more diverse set of founding populations of the Americas than previously accepted. And then there's like a little map here that shows uh, it's like a world map showing. Africa and Europe and Asia and the Americas and it's got like dots showing the relation areas between like Australia and New Guinea. Yeah, and it always shows like the the bigger dots are like the higher percentages maybe or maybe where they find more yeah, maybe the higher percentages or maybe the larger numbers of the population. Right. Um but yeah, so – but that's it, interesting it, because it, it doesn't it doesn't have any of the dots up in North America. I was going to say, Mexico yeah, area. so like you don't see a lot of the Asian – or the uh, – not Asian. You don't see a lot of the Australian or the Papua New Guinea or the Indonesian DNA popping up anything – or any – any further than like southern Central America. Right. So basically two different DNA sources into the Americas, which maybe there's more though, because like where the heck do those freaking Amazons come from? What is their DNA? Vikings. Maybe. <laughs> or the giants. Or the giants. Yeah. Um, which we're going to have to do an episode on giants. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> um, and then uh, he starts covering uh, this really cool phenomenon found in the Amazon jungle uh, called Terra Preta, which is a special type of soil. So the uh, rainforests in general, like the Amazon, are have like notoriously, like infamously bad soil. And actually a bunch of the Amazon keeps getting clear cut for like soybean farms and stuff. 
but the soil is so bad that like the farms are typically only viable for like a couple years before like the the soil gets depleted whether they fail or they just redo the soil or whatever yeah um they don't last very long yeah and so but there's this uh this special soil that gets found in the Amazon called Terra Preta that it's like black in color versus like a lighter brown that is the normal soil. Um, yeah, like a tan clay looking color. Yeah. But like, yeah, this Terra Preta is like black. They call it the black earth or whatever. Mm-hmm. Right. And what was the number you quoted as to how much they found? It was about 3%. Okay. So, so. The Amazon is 2.5 million square miles, and they find Terra, terra Preta in up to 3% of the Amazon soil. Which is pretty a incredible. <laughs> Let's That's look a lot. Up. Yeah. Uh, then... Uh, there's questions of like how it's made, the type of stuff that you find in it. You find uh, like a, you find charcoal. You find Sorry, compost. just real quick. Seventy-five thousand, right. seventy-five thousand square miles is about the estimated uh, estimated amount. Of amount. That's three percent of two point five million. Area. That's three percent of two point five million. Yeah. So this is a man-made soil. Um, right. That covers 75,000 square miles of the Amazon rainforest, and it's going to be centralized where the civilizations are, most yeah. likely. So there's a section in here where they talk about how um, the instances of finding Terra Preta are so closely linked with finding um, uh, civilization or finding like archaeological finds of people that... You can basically almost guarantee that anytime you find Terra Preta, you can also find like artifacts from humans. Yeah, like a lot of the time they're finding pottery shards and yeah, part- pottery shards and uh, the the microbial life inside of it is like incredibly diverse. It's like yep. super diverse to the point where they think that like something about the mixture of the charcoal. And the microbial life in the Terra Preta allows the soil to like hold on to nutrients and to also regenerate recycle it. Yeah, that get taken out. Yeah, because so normal Preta, soil, like when you when you plant in it, it starts to deplete those nutrients, and you have to keep fertilizing it, keep fertilizing it to put nutrients back in the earth to then keep growing. Whereas Terra Preta, it the the idea is that like the Whatever the composition of it is, it somehow replenishes the nutrients that you're pulling out by growing. And so you're able to keep growing in it over and over and over without over generations needing, and without needing to let a field fallow, without needing to rotate crops. Yeah, without having to rotate anything. And as far as what the terraprit is, is com- composed of, it says that. Um, it's abundant in organic material like plant and animal parts and tiny tiny pottery shards, usually high concentrations of low temperature charcoal residues, nutrients like nitrogen, phosphorus, and zinc, and high levels of micro organic acti- activity is found. So, right, and then like the conventional explanation is that. Basically, they would keep these midden heaps where they throw out like garbage and pottery and and compostable material, and that they sort of accidentally came up with this terra preta, like it's like essentially an accident. But that if it's an accident, how does that explain there being seventy five thousand square yeah, miles of it exactly? And also, when you like look at River of Darkness and Francisco de Oriana and all the other following expeditions and the reports of the population sizes in, in the Amazon of um, some estimates of like the entire Amazon being peopled by like tens of millions of people at that time. Yeah. Millions. I'm telling you, I know, I know a few people in uh, NorCal that could really use some Terra Preta. 
<laughs> if you know what I'm saying. Wink, yeah, wink. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it would save them a lot of money. Uh, but yeah, still to this day, no one really knows how to exactly make it and duplicate it, but it's highly sought after. Like people yeah. will go and find it and then use it to like mix into their soil. This is interesting. So I, I found an article from David Bennett. He's a biochemist from Cornell university university. Mm-hmm. He was talking about Terra Preta and this is in uh farm com on their website website. Mm-hmm. Um, there are a few factors that contribute to the, to this sustainable fertility. <laughs> there are only a few factors. Remember these soils were created 1000 to 5,000 years ago and were abandoned hundreds or, or thousands of years ago. Yet all over all those hundreds of, of years, the soils retain hot, <laughs> retain their high fertility in an environment with high decomposition, humidity, and temperatures. In this environment, environment, according to textbooks, the soil shouldn't exist, is what he says. Mm-hmm. And he's a biochem- biochemist. Right, because something like organic like that should just like die off. Should have eventually. After thousands dissipate. of years, it should dissipate or die off or... It need to be yeah, recycled. But and, that you know. something about it allows it to sustain itself for like for a long time. Um, and he goes on to say another interesting asp- aspect uh, aspect of Terra Preta's high fertility is the charcoal content of the soil. This was deliberately put into the soil by Indians, quote unquote, and doesn't only create doesn't only create a high higher organic matter and therefore higher fertility th- through better nutrient retention capacity, but this special type of carbon is more efficient in creating these proper properties. It is also true, true that Terra Preta is widespread almost anywhere in central Amazon. You can step out of the car and ask a, lo- a local, is there any Terra Preta around? And they'll show you it's everywhere. Mm. That's what he says. Yeah. So, I mean, to me, that seems like evidence of some sort of like, you know, science, some sort of understanding of the mixture of and the process of creating this stuff Mm -hmm. that and and like the point that Graham Hancock makes, because like the conventional explanation is that, yeah, like the midden heaps and that it's an accident and that, um, it just kind of came about. But Graham's point is that you, you need the Terra Preta in order to have large population um, bases in the Amazon in the first place. Because if you, um, sorry, (laughs) (laughs) I can't, man, these, these hiccups are killing me, man. Jeez, uh, I apologize for the distraction. Yeah, but I cannot help it. To listen to. I cannot help. I cannot help it. <laughs> I've been dealing with this. Literally, I took a first sip. Might as well. Let's take a little break, right? Okay. We're, we're yeah. drinking. A, the The reason I've got this, uh, these hiccups, <laughs> is this damn beer I'm drinking. Oh yeah, we did the, the review the beer. The very first. Sip I took of this beer started this entire thing. That you didn't have hiccups at nope. all today before nope. that? Nope. Wow. The very first sip I took, and this is a Dust Bowl Brewing Company. It's called Therapist. No appointment necessary. <laughs> <laughs> no appointment necessary. Imperial IPA. Oh my god. And it's 10.4%, Dad. Yep. That, I know you're listening. That's a strong one. Oh my gosh! I can't. I can't blame the percentage, but whatever happened, I took a sip and I got. I got hiccups. So if you like hiccups, if you if you are a, you have a thing for hiccups, drink this beer. Yeah, man. <laughs> All right, take we'll a take quick a quick break. break. Yeah, let's see if Drew's hiccups. Let's see. We can get those to go away and then oh, tell him he's not allowed to uh, have any beer for the rest of the show. I'm gonna I'm gonna chug this and then I'm not having any more. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> we'll be right back.
we like rushed back in Man. as soon as Drew stopped having hiccups. Oh my gosh. That was a that was a rough. That lasted quite a while. That was like forty minutes uh, straight, man. One has been throughout this whole podcast, but we've been we've been able to stop it a few times. So we're gonna rush back, get some get some content in here, <laughs> and see if we can maintain this. I'm, I've put my beer out of sight, <laughs> so I can't see it. I don't want to drink it. He doesn't trust it. No, I don't trust it anymore. And you know why? You know why? It's not a hazy. Yeah, right. I'm just saying. Maybe just you just can't out- handle Listen, a high alcohol content beer. Uh, You're a lightweight. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be asleep right now if I was a lightweight because it's 10.4%. I've already had two of these, so. Well, not quite. 1.75%. 1. 1.75. <laughs> <laughs> So, so where were we? Uh, Let's yeah. keep going here. Okay. Cool. So this uh, next uh, chapter in the book is really cool. It's called Gardening Eden. And Ooh. here he... Oh, yeah. This yeah. is one of my favorite parts of the book. Yeah. This, this is one of my favorite parts. This is where he lays out the argument that mm-hmm. the Amazon is essentially... A garden. A man-made garden. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I'm going to read a couple snippets here. Yeah, let's hear it. Uh, Further intriguing hints that some sort of intelligent guided project was mounted in the Amazon thousands of years ago are to be found in recent studies of the species of trees that populate the rainforest. Mm -hmm. These studies demonstrate that far from being a pristine natural environment, the Amazon is largely a human creation. Uh, When that research is done, it turns out that while Amazonian forests in different regions differ significantly from one another in topography, climate, geology, hydrology, structure, seasonality, history, they nonetheless often resemble each other in showing a pattern of unexpected dominance and density of a small group of plant species. This pattern has been found wherever Amazon forests have been inventoried and has yet to be explained by natural factors. Yeah, that's I, I know I know uh, Graham's talked about the Brazil nut tree, but there's other trees that are just like the palm tree, even. Yeah. Like, so the best current estimate is that the Amazon is presently home to about sixteen thousand woody tree species. That's it. Out of this total, however, only 227 hyperdominant species dominate Amazonian forests. These so-called oligarchs from the Greek for rule by a few make up only 1.4% of all the Amazon forest species, but almost half of the trees in any given forest. Wow. Even 16,000 woody tree species doesn't seem like a lot. Yeah, well, that's specifically the woody trees of, versus all plant life. Like, all plant life, you're talking hundreds of thousands of species. But even still, you're talking about 2.5, two, more than 2.5 million square miles of Amazon rainforest. Mm-hmm. And you're only talking about 16,000 woody tree species. That doesn't seem like a lot. That doesn't surprise me. As much. I mean, I it doesn't know. strike me as super low. I don't know. It seems low to me. But also, if you go back, go back real quick. Yeah. You can. But it says that only 227 are hyper dominant. Right. So, so this out of is where 16, you really, 000, really bring it down. trees make yeah. up 50% of yeah. the trees in most of the forest. Right. right, 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 right. And, you know, we know how the, the trees pollinate and spread. Like, it's all wind and, mm-hmm. and animals. They take it and they move it. Yeah. Right. But the the crazy thing is not just that it's a few amount of trees. It's which trees they are. They're trees that are fruiting trees. They're right. trees that are crops. And a lot of them show right. DNA evidence of domestication. Which, which also brings to count, like, naturally, right? Naturally, the things that are going to spread are the fruity, the nutty, the things yeah. that spread. Because those are the things that the animals are going to spread around. So in 2017, a large international team of ecologists and archaeologists led by environmental reset, environmental science researcher Carolina Levis of 
Wageningen. Oh, <laughs> let me take a crack at that. The Netherlands. Wageningen. 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 Okay, keep going. Sorry to you, uh, Netherlandians. Um, Norwegians? No, Netherlands. That's Norway. Yeah. <laughs> I think uh, the Netherlands is the Dutch. Yeah, that's right. Okay. There's only two things I hate in this world. People who are intolerant of other people's cultures and the Dutch. <laughs> we got both here. You got me and the and the Netherlandians. Uh, that's a quote from Austin Powers. If any of you are too young to have seen it or just for some reason haven't seen it. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Sorry. Anyway, so those people from the Netherlands, that crazy Wageningen University, <laughs> completed a study uh, looking at the peculiar <laughs> pattern of distribution. What immediately stood out in their data was that among the oligarchs, domesticated species are five times more likely than non-domesticated species to be hyperdominant. Mm. So of those 227... Five times more of those are domesticated species. So there are other domesticated species. It's there it's, are non-domesticated species that have become hyperdominant, but most of the hyperdominant, five times more of them, are domesticated. Okay. Okay. All right. Which is crazy. So. 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 No matter whether they're hyper dominant or not, there's still five times more of the 227 species that are. The 227 are the hyper dominant. No, right. But, but five yeah. times more than that are domesticated. So there's still more than the 227 species that no, are. No, no, it's saying within that 227. Oh, gotcha. Okay. You get a certain amount of them that are undomesticated, natural, and some of them that are domesticated. But there's five I times see. more of the domesticated ones. I see. Within the 227. Yeah. I got you. Okay. Okay. I'm with you. Okay. So among the favored species mentioned um, that are hyperdominant uh, includes the Brazil nut, the ice cream bean tree. I'm not saying the scientific names. Uh, the Amazon grape, the abiu, and uh, the cocoa tree, chocolate. Um, other prized Amazonian species domesticated in ancient times include the acai palm, the tu. Kuma palm. The Kuma. The peach Kuma. palm, the cupuaco <laughs> tree, cashew tree, and the rubber tree. There you go. Um, so indeed, although often overlooked, Amazonia has rightly been described as a major center of crop domestication on a global scale. Prior to the European conquest, according to Charles R. Clement, of Brazil's National Institute of Amazonian Research, at least 83 native species were domesticated to some degree, including manioc, sweet potato, cacao, tobacco, pineapple, hot peppers, as well as numerous fruit trees and palms. And at least another 55 imported neotropical species were cultivated. Mm. So not only did they cultivate and domesticate a bunch of the species that were already found in the Amazon, they imported species yeah. into the Amazon. Interesting. Once they've once they conquered. No, the Amazonians oh, they imported, imported species. Them. So they're not natural to the region then. Yeah, they originate outside of the Amazon. Mm, okay. That's a pretty crazy fact i think um yeah let me find that next bit um unlike the amazon itself large parts of which remain inaccessible to archaeologists uh these two co coastal peruvian valleys have been well studied yielding as well as manioc evidence for radiocarbon dated human cultivation of squash 9,240 uh, and 7,660 years before present. Peanuts, 7,840 years before present. 
quinoa 8,000 and 7,500 years before present, and cotton 5,490 years before present. What is notable, however, is that all of these crops had already been domesticated elsewhere before being grown in coastal Peru. Interesting. So. Wow. So that means that their, their trade network was vast. Yes. It was, was widespread up into the Americas, most likely, and possibly by boat to other places, right? Right. So basically these people are masters of agriculture. They wow. come up with terra preta that can make anything grow over and over and over right. again. They domesticate For a bunch generations. of- Generations. Yeah. And they specifically like had a big focus on domesticating like tree species. Mm-hmm. There was a lot of domestic trees. Yeah. It seemed like they liked the- the Domesticated trees. It seems like they liked the, the tree cover, the trees. Yeah. And that's probably because like- like what they this, saw. This sounds to me like a civilization who was living with the earth, right? Like they weren't fighting like against right. it to like dominate it and subdue it. Right. They had learned to live in harmony and they live in this rainforest. And so they found the species natural to it and cultivated the ones that were beneficial to them. Mm-hmm. And they create this soil that makes the rainforest even more um, plentiful. Right. Yeah. Well, and that gives gives me a, a little bit of a segue into some more modern time research that's been done. Right. Mm-hmm. So we've 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 talked about the the you know, the what was it, fifteen hundreds when um when the Spanish when the Spanish went through there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and this brings us into Oriana's expedition. Yeah, in the 1530s or 1540s. Yeah, 1541, 1542, I believe. Right. Um, it brings me into like the idea of like like Luke Caverns, and he's a more mm. he's a he's a much more modern um, anthropologist that's um, interested in in looking into a lot of these Amazonian ideas and like dude I love him I've heard him on a couple of interviews and apparently mm-hmm. his origin story is that he got inspired by like Graham Hancock and all yeah. this and he and, wanted and to Indiana like Jones. look into it all and yeah and Indiana Jones yeah and uh, instead of going like the Graham Hancock route, being like the renegade journalist who writes about right. science, he was like, right. you know what? I'm going to go get, get my degree. degree. Get a degree in archaeology. Yeah. That way I'm people can take it. his name seriously. Right. And I, apparently, Luke Caverns is a, a synonym. Is a, well, it's a false, not a synonym, not a, wait, what am I thinking of? It, I mean, a it's synonym a false is a word that. No, no, no not something. synonym, but. Pseudonym. Pseudonym. Yeah. Yeah. It's a fake name that he goes by. Yeah, it sounds that way anyway. I think he's actually confirmed it. Oh, okay. Yeah. Anyway, um, Luke Cavers, um talks about um, the idea that um, I, I lost my train of thought a little bit here. Um, the fact that the... I'm going to have to pause it for a second. <laughs> yeah, no worries. I wanted to point out one more sentence of Go the ahead. gardening stuff. So uh, an authoritative study published in Science suggests that these cultivated Peruvian squash plants may have been from a line that originally had been domesticated not in Mexico, but in southwestern Ecuador and the Colombian Amazon as early as 10,000 to 9,300 years ago. Whoa. Yeah. So, and especially like with the yucca plants we were talking about, the, mm-hmm. the, yeah, those plants we were the talking cover. about earlier that uh, you have to process in a certain way or right. else it's poison. Those go back like, Whoa. what, like six, seven, eight thousand years ago. But, and that's like the time of domestication. And why would you spend the time domesticating a plant that you couldn't process? So like they have to have had an even longer history with the plant to like figure out how to process it in order to even be motivated to domesticate yeah. it and produce it. Wow. So basically there's a lot of evidence that the Amazonian culture goes well, much deeper way back into the ice age. Wow. I mean, none of these dates specifically go to the ice age, but well, yeah. Cause a lot of times they're, they're dating, they're dating things that are relevant, but they're not necessarily they can't specifically date 
the civilization. Mm -hmm. You know, they can only date the things that they see, but right. Or the organic materials, but did you find what you want to talk about? I can keep going. Keep going. Yeah. Keep going. Um, yeah. So this is the part where he talks about, uh, yeah, that exact thing. Uh, Francisco de Oriana's 16th century voyage down in the Amazon ate unprocessed manioc roots, uh, survived, became mightily sick. Anyway, there, that's where he makes the point that right. we have evidence of the cultiva- cultivation of domesticated manioc by 8,000 or perhaps as much as 10,000 years ago. Follows that the ability to process it must have already been developed yeah. by then. So it's even older than that. So we're talking about like older than 10,000 plus mm-hmm. years ago that they f- figured out how to cultivate the plant. Right. So that because the 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 time frame of the domestication doesn't mean that that's the time frame of figuring it out because you there's a lot of processes that go into figuring it out too right, right. year like hundreds of thousands like hundreds of years or thousands of years of practices to figure out how to work this plant into a thing that you can use because it might have been something that easily grows right it's a root it's something that grows in the ground. Something that with a terra preta is easy to grow, probably. Sure. For them. But the problem gets even more complicated. Uh, so the same problem looms on an even larger, more complex scale with other plants in Amazon. And use and the uses to which they are put and the processing the re- they require. Anthropologist Jeremy Narby, author of The Cosmic Serpent, DNA, and the Origins of Knowledge, draws attention to curare. Uh, the blowgun and arrow poison mm. um, invented. We do not know when in the ancient Amazon it produces paralysis and death by asph- asphyxiation in the muscles required for breathing um, when they cease to function. It is used. Narby explains because it kills treeborn animals without poisoning their meat while causing them to relax their grip and fall to the ground. So monkeys, when hit with the untreated arrow, tend to wrap their tails around the branches and die out um, out of the archer's reach. So if you shoot a monkey without poison up in the tree, their tail's going to stay wrapped right. in death. But with this curare poison, if you hit them with a blow dart of it curare, that. it causes them to relax and it poisons wow. them, kills them. And it doesn't poison the meat. Wow. Um, so it's a very useful hunting aid, therefore. Wow. And one, moreover, that has been adopted into modern medical anesthesiology. Whoa, okay. But the real mystery, as Narby goes on to show us, is how it was ever invented in the first place. The consensus among scholars is that curare, of which there are 40 types in the Amazon, made from 70 plant species was stumbled upon by chance experimentation. Narby doubts this scenario, so this is Narby. To produce it, it is necessary to combine several plants and boil them for 72 hours while avoiding the fragrant but mortal vapors emitted by the broth. The final product is a paste that is inactive unless injected under the skin. If swallowed, it has no effect. It is difficult to see how anybody could have stumbled upon this recipe by chance experimentation. Yeah, that doesn't seem likely. So, so they were they. I mean, obviously, they had some sort of experimentation, mm-hmm. some sort, right? Whether it be there was an arrowhead that accidentally got dipped in this thing, and they got hit, and then somebody got hit by it. And they saw the effects of it, and they were like, "Okay, that makes sense. Let's now we're just going to tip everything in that, you know, or right. at least try it more, right? Right. Experiment with it a little bit, but it doesn't suggest that it's going to be a chance, right? You don't just like stumble upon a combination of dozens of plants that you have to boil for seventy-two hours and then inject under the skin in order to cause death. No, like." 
there's no. what some, I see is I mean I do see some kind of some kind of experimentation to refine it. Yeah, experimentation, but not just like wild experiment, like no. not just like guess and check. Chance. You it's don't just chance. like yeah. let's catalog all 150 thousand species of plants in the Amazon and right. try a combination of one after the other after right. the other. No, that would take millennia. Right, like you yeah. have to have some sort of science or theory or guidance. Yeah. And so that leads into like the uh, similar thing, which is that um, the same issue for ayahuasca. Mm -hmm. Ayahuasca itself is out of the 150,000 species of plants, two plants, a vine and a different plant, and either of them on their own are ineffective, don't do anything. But only when you mix the two of them together do you get the ayahuasca brew which can create like sustained visionary states. Right. So that's another one of those things you don't just stumble upon. Right. And when people ask the Amazonians, like the natives, mm. how do they come up with this stuff? They say that the plants told them. So essentially what they're claiming here is that they're using shamanism to commune with the spirits of the forest of the of nature, yeah, and it's those spirits that instruct yeah. them how to create these concoctions. Yeah, that goes back to our our previous episode on consciousness and how like the shamanism, like the layers of the onion, and like mm -hmm. how there's this like animal and plant like consciousness that they're tapping into when they go into these states of con of of shamanism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's so fascinating, man. You got more? I got a little bit more on this. Let's go, all right, let's keep going. Um, across much of the Amazon, the nexus that facilitates such interaction is the extraordinary visionary brew ayahuasca. Right. A plant medicine that has been in use among the indigenous peoples of this vast region for unknown thousands of years. It's active ingredient derived from dimethyltryptamine, DMT, an immensely potent hallucinogen, it, it is from the other ingredient, however, derived from Banisteriopsis copy vine. <laughs> the copy vine, yeah, I've heard that. Uh, that the brew gets its name. The function of the ayahuasca vine in the brew is to transmit a monoamine oxidase inhibitor into the bloodstream of the recipient so that he or she may gain sustained access to the extraordinary effects of DMT, a substance that is normally neutralized in the gut by the enzyme, the enzyme monoamine oxidase. Right. So the, um, so what it was, the, so the ayahuasca it's, or it was the, the DMT vine itself is the active ingredient is the active ingredient, but, the but if you ingest vine, it, it gets destroyed in your gut. Right. But the, the cappy vine, vine creates the environment within your gut that allows the you to oxidase yeah. inhibitor that inhibitor. Yeah. That allows the DMT to continue yeah. to enter your system and not be destroyed. Right. Okay. Uh, there are other ways of accessing the visionary power of Amazonian plants, rich in DMT, notably by snorting them as snuff, but the effects are short lasting taken orally in the form of ayahuasca brew. However, the experience can last up to six hours permitting a much more sustained and immersive trance journey. It is in my view, a remarkable scientific feat that such a highly effective combination of just two out of the estimated 150,000 different species of plants, trees and vines in the Amazon was discovered by mere trial and error. Nor if you ask Amazonian shamans, as I have done, how their ancestors made this discovery, they will admit to trial and error. They Will they admit to try or, trial and error at all? Or indeed to any other method that Western science would recognize as rational? What they claim very simply, but unanimously, is that a variety of plant spirits, among which ayahuasca is paramount, have taught them everything important they need to know about the properties of other plants in the jungle, thus allowing them to make powerful medicines to heal the sick and in general to be good doctors. And remember that passage mm -hmm. on the river of darkness where Caravajal was able to yeah. use magic curiosities or what it was the term. Uh, I can't remember the term he used. To, to cure. To heal. 
yeah. everyone other than the, the one war. guy who was mortally wounded. Right. Man. And it's also, um, you know, important to note that, like, the reason we don't have a lot of this knowledge in our, like, normal textbooks and stuff is, like, when the Spanish came and 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 did their conquests of this area, like, they burned so much of these codices and like all of this knowledge that these Amazonians and, right. and, and even in the, in Central America, they burned all of the knowledge that these people had. Right. You know, same as like, you know, similar well, that's to the what fact interests, that like, that's part of what yeah. interests me so much about the Amazon, because that was like the Spanish's MO, right? They right. come in, they try and convert you to be a docile population that they can use to take advantage of. And in order to do so, they take over your religions, convert burn you to all your knowledge, burn all your knowledge. Yeah. Right. But that didn't happen in the Amazon. That <coughs> happened in Mexico and Peru right. and a lot of the places that they did take over. That they settled. Yeah. Right. But what happened in the Amazon was a little bit different because remember what also came with the Spanish to flu and was all the diseases. Diseases. Yeah. Right. So it wasn't actually the Spanish just killing everyone that caused all the deaths and die offs. Right. It was smallpox, mm -hmm. it was flu, it was mm -hmm. measles, it was mm -hmm. all the the plague even, all the right. stuff that had been established in Europe that these people had immunity to that they were dorm that that they were bringing over with them. They hadn't they, they hadn't had any kind of defense for. Right. And so all the Americans didn't have a defense for it, right? And so the interesting thing about this mm. whole Amazon thing is that you get Oriana's uh, uh, excursion. What's the expedition? Expedition. Um, and then there's a couple other expeditions like within the next 10 or 20 years. Uh, and they report less and less populations. And then finally, later on, when Oriana uh, came back, right? No, when, like when like Jesuit priests and oh, like right. they actually did finally come through and like. Fully convert people and yeah. like all that. They reported that there was just like small hunter gatherer tribes. There was no civilization right. according to them. And that was like another hundred years that was later. Hundreds of years later. And yeah. that's part of why when the Carvajal's uh, account of Oriana's expedition finally resurfaced in the 1800s that people didn't believe it. Right. Is because there was like when they finally no did go back, there wasn't anyone there. But yeah. now that we know that there was people there, not just because of Carvajal's um but because of these new publication, but because got. of all of the LIDAR scans of the forest. Yep. Um, yeah, that's what we're gonna get into and next. The Terra Preta. And yep. so like there was a significant population. Yep. And that kind of gives us a good segue into like what is it like nowadays that we're finding that leads people like us to believe in these ancient civilizations like the Amazonian, you know, civilizations of the Amazon forest. Mm -hmm. Right. And it's these LIDAR scans that are now being done. Like before these LIDAR scans though, there were a few um, researchers that in the late 1800s and the early 1900s that did go and they did do research there physically. They went and they, they went and they saw these um, geometric mounds and also these just built up mounds on top of these plateaus that they built up and then there was these structures right there was these remnants of these structures but because in the amazon what they were building with was mud and they were building with uh, you know they were just building with the materials they had there they weren't building with stone it's not something that stone is not something that they had a lot of there they had mud right and because they had, <clears throat> yeah, it would just be the entire Amazon canopy falling down year after year yep. after year. All the like, it's just going to be a huge layer of sediment, right? And they were just using all that to build up these structures, which um, are considered pyramids. You know, when you reconstruct a lot of these things, and there are layers of stone. Like they use stone as almost like facing blocks. Like they use them as like a like a protective thing, but they're not all that protective when you're only using like you know, three foot 
stones. Yeah, right? I mean, maybe they favored, and they had no mortar. Yeah, maybe they favored wood as their building. Right. And they had lots of access to wood. They had they wood. Live in a it forest, was, it right? was basically wood and mud. They use wood and mud, and over time, when you get rains, you're in a rainforest. When you got rains and all these different elements, and that, you got farms surrounding your city with terra yeah. preta, yeah, this that are like, just going to overgrow. And then all of a sudden, oh yeah, and then in here it talks about like the estimate is that 99 percent of the population was wiped out by mm -hmm. disease mm -hmm. inside the Amazon. And so, if you lose 99 percent of everyone who knows anything. Then yep. what's going to be left? The the lucky survivors are not going to have the same capabilities. They're not going to be able to maintain these big cities, these big farms, this big knowledge base. Yeah. And they're going to turn revert back into hunter gatherers. So I want to read this quote from science magazine. Um, it's from uh, Lizzie Wade in the science magazine it's titled laser mapping reveals oldest Amazonian cities built 2,500 years ago. Um, and I was going to go to this. Although researchers don't yet know how many people lived in the Apano Valley, the settlements were large. The core area of the Kilimope, for example, covers an area comparable in size to the pyramid studded Giza plateau in Egypt or the main avenue of the Teotihuacan Teotihuacan in Mexico Teotihuacan in Mexico the extent of <coughs> Apano's landscape the modi uh, landscape modifications reveal garden cities of the ancient Maya, of the classic Maya the authors say and what's been discovered so authors and what's been discovered so far is just the tip of the iceberg of what could be found in the Ecuadorian Amazon Magias. So yeah, and then there's they go on to say there was a network of roads connecting the Oponocytes suggest that they're they all existed at the same time. They, because these roads connect all these different places. That's what our, a lot of these are. That's like what Oriana the, and Carvajal or, reported too. Is these right. huge roads? Uh, there was the one point where he finally like there was inland, one point where right? he went inland. Oh, and yeah, I forgot that that was the bit that spooked him. So he, he they decided to take a road inland, and they said it wasn't more than a couple leagues, and then all of a sudden the road. Uh, widened, widened into what yeah. they called like a highway, yeah, like four car, like four car lengths in our well, modern. I mean, I don't know, but like it was huge, and mm -hmm. they were super impressed by it. But they, oh, that's what freaked them out, and they were like, "Well, any civilization that has done something this impressive, like, is going to be very. We powerful. can't just like we can't just stroll vault in there. In there. We're, yeah. We may never come back. Yep. Yeah. So it says the. You know the 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 road the roads connecting the sites suggest that they all exist at the same time. They are a millennium older than other site other complex Amazonian societies, including um, Lanos de Mojios, Mo, Mojos, um, a recently discovered ancient urban system in Bolivia. The Apano Valley cities were denser and more interconnected than sites in Lanos Mojios. Or Mojo, sorry. Um, Rostein says, we say Amazonians, but we should say Amazonias to capture the region's ancient cultural diversity, he says. Mm -hmm. So that's just a little bit of wordplay, yeah. a little bit of The other context. point I wanted to make when you were talking about how like the Spanish would come and like burn everything mm -hmm. is because the people in the Amazon mostly died to the disease and not to, to Spanish like violence. Right the Spanish never had to come through and burn everything. That's true. And so true, yeah. depending on how they wrote, what if they wrote. we actually go and excavate we a bunch of these sites, stuff, we so. might find some writing still. Well, and I know that they, they call these, the, the, the codices are like, um, well, not the codices, the Mayan, codices. The Mayan codices were like these, like zigzag folded, you know, text, but, um, what, um, I think there's Luke like Caverns two of talks them about left, right? what what Luke Caverns talks about is these like almost high relief 
um, images like hieroglyphs mm -hmm. and they're like these like square looking images that each of them have like a four quadrant thing and their images like their faces and their like the image of a wind or like a cloud or like whatever it might be and each of those is four words so there's four mm. quadrants in a in a in a thing and each of those is four words Oh, interesting. So, and they've discovered some of these in some of the sites, but they haven't gone to discover as much as they could discover if right. they were to actually go deeper and deeper right. into it. And he also talks about like these like faces you see in when you're walking around inside the jungle there, like these, the, not, not just faces, like, like an image, like we're talking about like, ro like a, like a whole rock cut face right mm, so what we're talking about yeah. like oh like you're talking about edge, like the olmec heads the, the no, no no not even just the olmec heads we're talking about like the side of a of a temple mm. like almost like if it was like a lookout post like imagine like a like a world war ii bunker right you see this little slit where you could look out of but yeah. it's a concrete bunker yeah imagine that but you have two eyes that have like defined eyebrows once you peel away a lot of the jungle you have these defined eyebrows that that right underneath are eyeballs, and then right underneath that there's there's stone that create part of the face, and then there's a, a giant slit for a mouth. Hmm. So it looks like a face. You're just walking through this path through the jungle, and all of a sudden you see this giant face looking at you. Yeah. But all you can see is the eyes and the mouth. Yeah. But once you start peeling that away, you start seeing the eyebrows, you start seeing the different defining features. But on top of those is what he assumes is going to be temples. It's what he assumes is going to be like higher, like not like more to be discovered basically. But right. all you see is trees and foliage. Yeah. That's all you see is, and then a face. So I, I got to catch a little bit of the Luke Caverns interview. Um, it's very good. And That's he good. talked about um, a bunch of the pyramids that are found in central mm -hmm. and South America yep. and uh, how a bunch of them, if, all right. So like if you grant the Egyptologist dating mm -hmm. of the Egyptian pyramids, right. and all the Egyptian buildings, then these would be way old hundreds of years, or if not thousands in some cases before older. the Egyptians. Mm -hmm. And so like the first big pyramid building is not from Egypt. It's right. actually from South America. Right. And and they even talk about some of them are are wider footprint. Like they have mm -hmm. they have more footprint than even the Giza like the, the pyramids of Giza have. A lot uh, granted they are made of mud and and, and so not all and of wood, them. Some of them are made of stone. Some of them, yeah, but a lot of them are just, they're like terraces that are made like, and a lot of these are made well, like, you're talking in about the generation of the Amazon rainforest. I'm just talking South America in general. So, okay, like yeah. the Inca and the Aztec. And, oh, right. Yeah, right. Yeah. So, like, uh, like on the, the ones that are survived on the west obvious. side of the Andes, mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. like the Inca were like the right. pre Inca civilizations, there's buildings there where they show like, seismic resistant building mm -hmm. techniques right that's true uh, he talks about evidence of of so like roadways coming out of those out of peru the those that area of peru into this area where there's these acids that are naturally found and that these acids are hypothesized like they're supposedly able to like fuse granite oh shit and so, like, the theory being that they're, like, how they're doing this, like, polygonal, mm. weird shape combination oh, of yeah. building techniques is that they're using this acid to, like, fuse these granite blocks together, which is how they're able to build these crazy wow. things without any mortar. Wow. Well, and a lot of the building techniques in Peru were are also the similar like when you talk about like like if you look at like the brothers of the serpent unfinished um series like they that they do or the the i don't know what you'd call it but the the unfinished podcast that they had and they also do it in the um um oh my god what is the name of the the um Was a thing they're on recently? 
No, it was just the oh the Cosmic Summit. Oh yeah, when they do their presentation, when yeah. Russ does his presentation at the Cosmic Summit, it's the, it's the unfinished thing. They talk about like similarities between Peru and um, ancient Egypt, mm-hmm. and how like a lot of these like like the scoop marks they talk about, and like a lot yeah. of these like fusion of the the stone itself, and like. There's no, there's no. We haven't talked temporary about yet, so I know. Yeah, people, if you have not seen this, Google search, and yeah. we'll we'll show some photos here. Yeah. If you're watching on YouTube, they'll just be there. If you're listening on podcasts, if you don't know this, you can look at your podcast player while we're talking. If you're using the podcast app or Overcast, I'm not sure what other ones support it, but we put in chapter art. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. and you can actually show you too. images. Anyway, so look at your phone. Look at your YouTube. Right now. Right now. These are scoop marks. Yeah. Quote, unquote, scoop marks. When we look at, like, the ancient Egyptian quarries that they're quarrying all the stone from, the really old stuff, you don't, like, in some of the stuff, you do see evidence of, like, copper chiseling and stuff, and you see all this, like, copper dust that shows evidence of, like, copper chiseling. But then in other areas... There's these like what looks like ice cream scoops yep. out of the rock. Yep. And we have no clue what can do that. No. Nope. But Luke Caverns just shows some of the stuff in uh similarities in, in South Peru. America, yeah. Central America, where there's scoop marks. Yep. Over here too. And so like and clearly, megalith and megalithic stones. We're talking two civilizations, roughly a world apart. Roughly around similar time frames, mm-hmm. a world apart, using what seems to be similar technology so, or techniques or whatever it might be. Yeah. Like either they're in communication with each other, they're like able to talk and travel and communicate. Or if you don't want to grant that, which maybe you don't. Maybe they come from a singular. Voice. Maybe they both have inherited knowledge from a previous a source civilization s- source. that yeah. both contributed to both of them. Right, and that ties back into our Yoga Dryas episode. And like whatever that source civilization was, getting wiped out by the Younger Dryas event. And then some of them be surviving and settling amongst uh, different civilizations around the world, mm-hmm. because if you were if you were to grant the fact that these were uh, uh, world traveling technologically in in their time or for whatever technology they had, they were technologically technologically advanced, and maybe it was the same person, maybe it was multiple people that just spread out around amongst the world to try to survive, right? Yeah, and they spread their knowledge as what whatever knowledge they could provide to be able to survive with different tribes or different peoples around the world. They would they would share whatever they could to be able to survive. Yeah, right. And that could be why you're seeing all these similarities around the world and their building practices and their um, religions and mm-hmm. all these different things that you know and that might be why you speaking see, of the religion so like what you mean by that there's a, another right. chapter in America Before by Graham Hancock where he talks about there's some really weird eerie similarities between some of the Native American um, uh, religions revolving around like what happens when you die and mm-hmm. the process of like entering the afterlife as yeah. well as with the Egyptians. Right. So like there's similarities as far as like you, you die and you go see a God that like tests you, you and judges you and you have to travel across the Milky way. And they have like certain stars that you stop at that are the same between the two just yeah. like really weird Weirdly details to like have in common. Yeah, we're gonna which ties into that like Y Files episode where they're talking about oh, like, yeah. the Egyptians and the Grand Canyon. Yeah, yep. I'll link to that because that one's super fun. I love that episode. I don't know what to think about it, but man, is it if it's not good, like food for the imagination. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've looked into it a little bit, and there's a lot of people that say that it's not true, but until you go and find out for yourself, we can never know. So, you know, like. Obviously, this isn't great proof, but 
when you hear him, like as part of that episode, he actually calls the Smithsonian and asks oh, the lady yeah. about it. Oh yeah. And you hear her tone, you hear how short she is with him yeah. about it. She is pissed that he is calling about it. Yeah. Like she's heard it before and she's like, I so maybe there's just this. a bunch of like wacky, like ancient civilization researchers that end up calling the Smithsonian all the time. But like, maybe she doesn't like having to talk about it. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, man, I can't believe it's been two hours already. Yeah. I hope you didn't mind the hiccups too much. We'll try to, um, <laughs> 20 eliminate them as much as possible. Straight of hiccups. God. I hope you enjoyed. Yeah. You know, Things happen. Duality and- <laughs> check <laughs> this week. <laughs> Man. Um, and we did a whole segment without being recorded technically. Yeah. So I mean, it's been a it's been a eventful episode. Totally. You know, it's now one AM. We so gonna, uh we're gonna call, we're gonna put out a call soon. to you guys. Uh write us. Do you have any hiccup Please. remedies? Because Drew's oh classic remedy didn't work. Yeah, it didn't. I hit a vape and it worked, which, which I don't weird. recommend. His normal remedy. What's your normal remedy? Describe it. Yeah, it's basically like taking a giant gasp of air and holding it for a few few seconds, and then and then swallowing it while holding, and then take as as much more air as you can possibly take, swallowing that. And then take as much more air as you could possibly take, swallow that, and then hold, 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 hold until you just can't hold it anymore, and then you let it out. And it's worked for me many times, but tonight the beer got the best of me. <laughs> There's too much bubbly, too much and gas. And with all the much, air swallowing, he was burping for quite I was a burping, while. yeah. I was, it, was a, it was a mess. <laughs> But we got through it, and I hope it wasn't too annoying. We'll definitely edit it. Give us your hiccup remedies. Let us know what you think about the Amazon. Um, If you have any extra details on any of this stuff that you'd like to share, please do. Write us at hosts at dualitycheck.net. By the way, I am currently working on the show notes. Like when we first launched the show, I, I spent like days. Like changing the show note structure and then republishing, changing, republishing until I got them just how I wanted. And now I just went back and looked and it just shows like half of our summary paragraph and it cuts off. So in the podcast player, you don't get all the links and stuff oh. that I spend so much time working on. Oh, shit. I'm going to try and figure this out. But until I do, if you want all of our links and all of the images the and website. everything – Go to dualitycheck.net and just click episodes and go to the episode that you're listening yeah. to. We've got I spent a lot of time actually like cultivating yeah. like recommended reading, all the books we talk about, all the like different articles. It's not showing up, huh? Not at the moment. I, yeah. I will figure it out, but it may take me a while. I'm not sure how long it'll take me to f- solve it, but I'll if figure it out. If you already know, let us know too. So we yeah, can actually, yeah, if you're a computer a dude. Bit. Maybe I'll have to ask uh, our cousin Jake. He, he uh, might know. He's uh, he's offered, offered a couple to help. times. Yeah, he's to offered help to help. The website. So, but we're open to help. We're you know we're still new to this thing, and we love to uh, interact with people who you know have interesting things and points of view on life. And you know, if you're willing to help us in any shape or form, and I know we talked about it in the beginning of the episode, but yep. if you want to listen through and and you hear some kind of snippet that might sound good on social media or it might sound good as far as like, you know, alerting the masses to what kind of content we've got, let us know. Also, if you're enjoying the show, if you can go on Apple Podcasts and give us a review, yeah, that that actually helps us be discovered by other people. Yeah. If you're on YouTube, leave us a comment, leave like, us a like, subscribe, give us a subscribe. That helps us with the algorithm. Yeah, we're just like a couple dinguses chilling <laughs> yeah. here, trying to figure out how to do a podcast, and we could use all the help you guys could offer us. So absolutely. Um, we yeah, appreciate we're very anything you're fact. willing to do. Uh, and if you're not, that's fine. Yep. If, if you're, you're just a, a lurker and that's laughing fine Drew's too. 30 minute straights of burping. Oh, man. Yeah. <laughs> I want to hear that in the comments too, how annoying that was. Yeah. We're going right. to, we're going to do our best to make it not so annoying in the, in the editing, but <laughs> I don't know how, how much we can do for we'll that. We'll see how it turns out. I should be able to duck it. Like you'll hear the echo yeah. of your burps in my microphone. Right. Right. But. Right. And there's not much I can do when you're like in the middle of a sentence I and know. you're like something yeah. something in the yeah. Amazon. I know, man. <laughs>
That is unfortunate. But this has been a, a challenging and, and very worth it, though. I think this conversation was great. Thanks for joining us. I appreciate you guys' time. And uh, we'll see you next week. Adios. Later. Thank you.